Abraham, should we start with the awards presentation? I can start sharing the screen here. Sure, let's go ahead. Okay. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be talking to you today. Dr. Harrington is uh, at uh, the last, uh, last of his meetings of the American Heart Association, and so he won't be able to join us, um, and he regrets that greatly. But it's my privilege to present the uh, department's teaching awards. Uh, as you know, uh, as part of our mission of clinical care research, uh, teaching remains one of the most critical things we do, but especially in the last few months, it's been easy to neglect the wonderful teaching efforts that continue to go on under the most trying circumstances. So it's really a pleasure for me to be uh, mentioning these awards today. As you know, typically we have all the invitees come physically to Grand Rounds. We uh, give them the award. It's a wonderful moment for them to celebrate in front of their peers, their colleagues. Uh, but obviously for uh, reasons of COVID, we're not going to do that this year. We're gonna ask each division to please uh, spend a little more time at their next division meeting uh, to acknowledge these wonderful recipients that you see here. I'm going to read out their names. Um, um, you can hold your applause to the end. Uh, so first in biomedical informatics research, we have uh, Jonathan Palmer and Natalie Pagler. In blood and bone marrow trans transplantation, we have Wen Kai Wang. In cardiovascular medicine, uh, we have Christine Hayfley. In endocrinology, we have Deborah Selmeyer. <clears throat> Gastroenterology is Aparna Gol. In hematology, Randeep Singh. In hospital medicine, it's uh, our very own host of these wonderful grand rounds, and I can't tell you how proud I am of him for the way he's orchestrated this and you know, brought our numbers to huge uh, levels compared to the physical grand rounds, Errol Osdalga. Immunology, rheumatology, it's Lorinda Chung. Infectious disease, Dora Ho and Marissa Holbar. In nephrology, it's Pedram Fateh. Uh, the Saul Rosenberg Faculty Teaching Award in Oncology goes to Neil Gupta and to Alison Corin. Uh, the Primary Care and Outcomes Research Award is to Jeremy Goldharbor Favert. The Primary Care and Population Health Award goes to Linda Barnum, Barman, sorry, and Benjamin Lonikaya and Tamara Montecute. In Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care, the award is to Yon Sung. And finally, the Stanford Prevention Research Center, the award is to Marcia Stefanik. Uh, I'm now pleased to present the Master Teacher Award. This is an award that uh, had its first year uh, last year, and it's reserved for a teacher who has won so consistently within the division that uh, we've decided to institute the Master Teacher Award and retire their award subsequently. Uh, their name goes on a plaque in the Department of Medicine offices. And this year, on the next slide, if you would, Errol, I'm very pleased to, uh, to show you that the Master Teacher Award this year is Timothy Myers, who has won at least seven times in the last uh, many years. Uh, Tim is a graduate of Harvard, uh, came here for his residency, back to the Brigham for his nephrology training, has been a pioneer in basic uh, nephrology research, and has had a long career here at Stanford, including uh, being division chief. Um, his teaching prowess is just amazing, and I want to read two quotes to you from a, a, a fellow of his first. This is from Dr. Tammy Surich, and she says, I have never met anyone with such a passion for teaching as Dr. Timothy Meyer. I remember as a brand new nephrology fellow, I had no idea how to analyze a research article, let alone present it for our division's journal club. Dr. Meyer must have spent three hours going over the article with me so that I could present it with confidence. Now, 10 years later, he still teaches me something new every time we interact. We're truly fortunate to have Dr. Marr educating the future nephrologists of the world. Uh, his chair, uh, Glenn Scherto, has this to say, uh, Dr. Marr has educated a generation of Stanford faculty, fellows, residents, and students on the complexities of renal physiology, salt and water balance, and the kinetics of dialysis therapy. His quixotic quest in search of a putative uremic toxin is known the world over. For his local, national, and international educational efforts, 
he's being awarded the division's master teacher award the department's master teacher award so with that i'm going to turn it back to errol and just to say it's been a very trying situation for people to try and teach in the setting of virtual patient care televisits but my hats off to all of the teachers who are doing such an amazing job out there we salute all of you but especially our winners today thank you very much abraham thank you so much I, I... And certainly, I don't know about myself, but a lot of amazing uh, teachers uh, today that I've known personally for many years. I might just say, I remember over 10 years ago at the VA uh, rounding as a resident with Dr. Meyer, and I still remember it like yesterday. He's such a great teacher and an amazing person. So I'm personally very happy to see him win this award. Um, we're going to just switch over a couple things now. Uh, next week, we'll have Ethics and COVID-19 with Dr. David Magnus, followed by uh, a New York uh, COVID surge experience by Dr. Jeremy Breitler, who, um, who did uh, give uh, a pulmonary critical care ground rounds. I heard so much amazing stuff about uh, that presentation that we asked him to come and do medicine grand rounds. Um, and before we move into uh, today's uh, main speakers, I just wanted to apologize again. Those of you who are joining, I'm glad you're able to join. Uh, Zoom was uh, initially, as I was going to force the need for passwords for webinars, but they changed that at the end of last week. Apparently on the back end, they turned off uh, they forgot to turn off the force of using passwords, so we were surprised that a password was needed. It's not supposed to be needed, and it shouldn't be for future. We'll get that fixed with IRT um, right after this, but we apologize for the inconvenience today. Um, moving on now, we don't want to waste any more time. Um, obviously, we, we will. this is recorded, and we will make sure this is available hope, as soon as possible after today, um, and hopefully more people are joining throughout this presentation as they get the emails with the updated password. Uh, but again, apologize. apologize for that issue. Um, but we have two really wonderful uh, presenters today on a topic that's been one of the most um, highly requested topics, uh, COVID-19 and regards to uh, hematology. And um, I'm gonna stop sharing this for a second. And uh, just some notes uh, I, I took. So actually I've known Dr. Berube for many years. Dr. Hollenhorst uh, is new to us in the past few years and uh, she's a clinical instructor, both pathology and medicine. Um, she holds a, a, when I was looking up and I had some notes here, but when I was looking up her, uh, her CV, she had uh, lots of different awards since she's been uh, with us since in fellowship and in training. And she clearly is an amazing clinician and we're really lucky to have her had joined us uh, in the past few years. Um, she's also along with Caroline and a number of the hematologists have been it's amazingly helpful to us as, as uh, hospitalists and all the clinicians trying to understand what's the best thing to do to take care of our patients. And they've been giving us many presentations throughout the, uh, the last um, weeks to months. Um, Dr. Carolyn Berube is an associate professor in medicine hematology. Um, she's a director of the oral um, anti anticoagulation clinic. And I'll just say, again, having been there for 10 years, Dr. Berube has been one of the go-to people that I think everybody knows who's been on campus around here as, as an expert in many things in hematology. She's an amazing clinician and um, someone I've leaned on for advice and knowledge uh, for many years. So I'm really happy and thankful to have both Dr. Holnhorst and Dr. Brube here with us today um, and with this presentation. So with that being said, uh, Marie, I'll turn it over to you for the first part of the presentation. And if we need to, we can certainly go over a little bit for Q&A um, to make sure we get all the questions answered. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you so much, Errol, and thank you to the other organizers of Medicine Grand Rounds for giving us this opportunity to discuss coagulation and clotting conundrums in COVID-19. I'm going to begin by discussing COVID-19 associated coagulopathy, and then I'll talk about the incidence and proposed pathogenesis of thrombosis in COVID-19. Then Dr. Berube will discuss prevention and management of COVID-19 associated thrombosis. And finally, she'll discuss ongoing and planned clinical trials targeting thrombosis in COVID-19. One early insight that came from studies of COVID-19 patients who were admitted to hospitals in China was that many of these patients have an elevated D-dimer. And this leads to the first clinical conundrum that we're going to be discussing in this talk. What is the significance of an elevated D-dimer in COVID? On this slide, I'm showing data from a publication in The Lancet by Zhao et al. They looked at uh, patients who were admitted to the hospital in China with COVID-19. They found that an elevated D-dimer at the time of hospitalization was common. So 42% of patients when they presented to the hospital with COVID-19 had a D-dimer greater than one microgram per mil. Additionally, they found that an elevated D-dimer had prognostic value when they compared those patients who had an elevated D-dimer at time of presentation against those who had a normal D-dimer, 
they found an odds ratio of in-hospital mortality of 18. And these two findings that hospitalized patients commonly have an elevated D-dimer and that this value has prognostic utility in terms of in-hospital mortality has been fairly reproducible. This has been found in a variety of other um, cohorts of COVID-19 patients now outside of China. Further, Zhao et al. found that D-dimer levels correlate with disease severity, and this is illustrated in a graph from their Lancet paper. So on the x-axis, they have days of um, illness, and on the y-axis, they have a D-dimer concentration. In the blue, they have those patients who survived to hospital discharge, and you can see that those patients tended to have a low D-dimer value in the beginning, and their D-dimer values remained low throughout the course of their illness. This is in contrast to those patients who did not survive to hospital discharge, who began with a relatively higher D-dimer value, and these D-dimer values escalated over the course of their hospitalization. So these early findings um, that many COVID patients have an elevated D-dimer led people to be interested in what other hematologic and coagulation abnormalities COVID-19 patients may have. Initially, there was a lot of discussion about whether COVID patients may have a coagulopathy that looks like disseminated intravascular coagulation. But with further investigation into this, it seems that actually COVID-19 patients may have a more unique coagulopathy. And so that's what I'm going to discuss next. How is the coagulopathy in COVID similar to or different than DIC? So as you're likely familiar with, acute decompensated DIC results from diffuse activation of the coagulation system which results in diffuse formation of microvascular thrombi, and then a consumptive coagulopathy that is manifest on labs with an elevated PT, an elevated PTT, and a low platelet count. With fibrinolytic breakdown of these microthrombi, you develop an elevated D-dimer as well. So how does this look different in most patients who present to the hospital with COVID, who have what is now being termed COVID-associated coagulopathy, or CAC, C-A-C? Well, these patients also have an elevated D-dimer, but it seems that their D-dimer is elevated even more markedly than we tend to see for acute DIC. COVID patients more commonly have a normal PT and PTT or only mild elevations of the PT and PTT. They seem to have less of a consumptive coagulopathy than we would see in a typical case of DIC. This is also evident in the fact that most COVID patients have a normal platelet count or sometimes a mildly low platelet count, but the platelet counts don't seem to get quite as low as they do in DIC. Another really important difference is that in the most extreme manifestation of acute decompensated DIC, the fibrinogen will be very low. This is in contrast to COVID-associated coagulopathy, which tends to be associated with an elevated fibrinogen. So while there are variable manifestations of acute DIC, the most predominant phenotype is usually bleeding. And this contrasts with our current understanding of the situation in COVID, where it seems that thrombosis predominates over bleeding. So this leads to the next question, how common is thrombosis in COVID? So most of this work has been focused on venous thromboembolic events in COVID patients. So that is DVT and PE. And so that's what I'm going to be focusing on here. There have been a variety of different studies of this issue, and I'm going to take you through those studies that I think are most uh, revealing. So the first study was published by Clock et al., working in the Netherlands. They looked at COVID-19 patients who were admitted to ICUs there, and they found a 27% incidence of VTE in this cohort. Another key study in this area was published by Middeldorp et al., of note in their study, they, a subset of their patients were subjected to routine screening venous ultrasounds. And so they, as opposed to most of the other work in this area, did not only report on clinically apparent VTE events, but some uh, that were not clinically apparent and were just incidental radiographic findings. So because of this, their statistics are um, some of the highest that have been reported in this area with a 47% incidence of VTE in ICU COVID patients. But of note, this contrasted with quite a low incidence of VTE outside of the ICU, only 3%. So this initial work in the Netherlands, as well as other reports um, from China and elsewhere, led to an early question in this area, which is, is this uh, VTE incidence that we're seeing in COVID-19 patients merely a manifestation of the fact that this is a sick population? We know that anyone who is admitted to the hospital, and even more so anyone who's admitted to the ICU, is at higher risk of developing VTE than a healthy population, 
even with routine institution of pharmacologic VTE prophylaxis? Or in contrast, is there some specific hypercoagulability that's conferred by a unique biology of COVID-19, making these patients even more hypercoagulable than any other ill population might be? And so the next two studies from France tried to address this question. The first one, Poissy et al., looked at pulmonary emboli in patients who were admitted to ICUs there with COVID-19, and they found a 21% 20 per, incidence of PE in that cohort. They compared that to the incidence of pulmonary emboli in a matched cohort of patients admitted to the ICU with influenza, and they found a statistically significant lower rate of PE in that cohort of only 7.5%. A similar study was done by Helms et al, where they found a 12% incidence of VTE in uh, COVID ARDS patients in the ICU. And this contrasted with a 5% rate in non-COVID ARDS patients. And so these papers highlighted the fact that perhaps there is a unique hypercoagulability associated with COVID-19. Further work in the United States comes from a study that was published in Blood earlier this month by workers uh, publishing on uh, rates of VTE from five ho hospitals in Boston. And of note, uh, this study had one of the lowest rates of VTE that's been uh, found uh, across these different studies. Only 8% incidence of VTE in ICU patients and only 3% outside of the ICU. Of note, not all of these studies have reported a bleeding rates, but this paper reported a 2% major bleeding rate. So highlighting the fact that VTE is likely more common than bleeding, but still there is a risk of bleeding in COVID-19 patients that we need to consider when uh, thinking about how we're going to try to prevent and manage VTE in these patients. And finally, Dr. Collins, Desai, and Ahuja graciously provided me with data from their analysis of COVID-19 patients at Stanford and Stanford Valley Care. They looked at DVT, PE, as well as ischemic CVA across patients in the ICU as well as the wards, and they found a 5% incidence of VTE. So overall, how can we interpret these findings? I think that um, it seems that there's an increased incidence of VTE in COVID-19 patients in the ICU compared with those outside of the ICU. I think there's a suggestion that there may be a unique hypercoagulable state associated with COVID-19, but we need to understand this more through larger studies. And I think it's very interesting to note that the studies in the United States, both in Boston and at our own institution, are showing lower rates of VTE compared with the earlier reports uh, from China and Europe. So in that prior slide, I was focused on macrovascular venous thromboembolic events, but overall, what types of thrombotic events occur in COVID-19? So in general, this hasn't been completely consistent across reports, but it seems that in general, pulmonary embolism predominates over deep venous thrombosis. Um, it also seems quite consistent that venous thromboembolic events are more common than arterial. In one study, there were about tenfold more venous events compared with arterial events. In general, arterial events have been not as well studied in COVID-19, so we don't have as much information on their incidence. There have been a number of case reports and small case series of a variety of different types of arterial events, including stroke, acute limb ischemia, and there's also been discussion about MI, but I think that we need to get more information about arterial events in COVID-19. So in addition to categorizing these uh, thromb thromboses as venous versus arterial, we can also categorize them according to macro versus microvascular. So we've been talking so far about macrovascular thrombosis. That is a thrombosis that's radiographically apparent. And here I'm showing a PE protocol CT from a publication of a patient with COVID-19, where you can obviously see a large pulmonary embolism. And here on images from the same CT scan in the same patient, you can see that this was in the context of a patient with likely significantly uh, inflamed lungs as a result of their COVID-19 pneumonia. And this seems to be a, a common pattern and trend in um, these patients that the uh, thromboses seem to occur in the setting of significant pulmonary inflammation. Um, there have also been a number of autopsy reports that have documented uh, pulmonary arteriolar microvascular thromboses. And I'm showing you here histology images from one of these autopsy um, reports that was published. And similar to the macrovascular thromboses, these microvascular thromboses seem to also occur in the context of significant uh, pulmonary inflammation. 
And so I highlight that co-occurrence of pulmonary inflammation with thromboses because this may be important when thinking about the pathophysiology of thrombosis and coagulopathy in COVID-19, which is the subject of the next set of slides. So in general, when we think about risk factors for a thrombosis, we can think of them in terms of three categories of risk factors, according to Verkaus triad. The first is stasis, and we know that uh, the patients that we're typically looking at here are inpatient and in the ICU and are immobilized. The second is endothelial injury, and there's a lot of really interesting discussion about uh, a unique endotheliopathy with, which may occur in COVID-19. This is because it um, is possible that SARS-CoV-2 can enter vascular endothelial cells, which express the ACE2 receptor that we know is critical for viral entry into cells. And there's evidence from autopsy reports of viral invasion into the endothelium and consequent endothelial activation and um, endothelial pathology, which we know contributes to a prothrombotic state. Finally, in terms of thinking about hypercoagulability, there's been a lot of attention on the idea of immunothrombosis. And so this is the idea that there's significant crosstalk between the immune system and the coagulation cascade with multiple areas of bi-directional feedback between these two processes. There's been a lot of discussion about uh, different uh, specific mechanisms in the immunothrombosis realm. So these include cytokines. We know a variety of cytokines are elevated in COVID-19. And we know that cytokines can contribute to endothelial injury and can also directly activate the coagulation cascade. Additionally, we know that in an inflammatory setting, monocytes and macrophages can become activated, leading to surface tissue factor exposure, which also contributes to direct coagulation cascade activation. There's also interest in the complement pathway and contact activation pathways and how those might be relevant in COVID-associated thrombosis. And finally, one really interesting um, uh, idea in the realm of immunothrombosis is uh, neutrophil extracellular trap formation, or netosis. So this is a mechanism that is thought to um, uh, uh, be protective in some cases against um, infection, um, whereby neutrophils become activated and they extrude DNA and histones. And this extracellular DNA forms a mesh that then entraps um, infectious organisms such as viruses or bacteria. Um, this may be a protective mechanism that can then go awry and can uh, serve as a platform for fibrin deposition and platelet deposition, allowing formation of a nascent microvascular thrombus. And so because, as I was highlighting in the last few slides, of the fact that it seems in COVID that there's this co-occurrence between inflammation and thrombosis, it seems that these immunothrombosis mechanisms may be particularly relevant here. And there's a lot of interest in understanding these mechanisms more so that we might be able to specifically target them. So in summary for this part of the talk, D-dimer is a marker of COVID-19 disease severity and is associated with poor prognosis. COVID-19 associated coagulopathy, CAC, differs from DIC. Thrombosis is more frequent than bleeding in COVID-19. And immunothrombosis and endotheliopathy may drive CAC and thrombosis. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Berube for the next portion of the talk. Excellent, Marie, thank you so much. That was really great. Okay, great, and then while Caroline is uh, sharing her slides, uh, thanks for all the questions that are coming through. We'll save all of them, of course, until after Dr. Brube is done with her section. We can see everything fine, uh, Caroline. Yeah, somehow I cannot advance my slides. You can try using the rotary part of your mouse if you have, or the arrows on your keyboard. Or yeah, or those arrows too should probably do good. The one on the far right. Sometimes uh, it's hard to click the PowerPoint when you're in Zoom, so it knows that you want to go forward. Do you have a, a rotary wheel on your mouse? Uh, yes. Does that advance it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me, uh, Errol. Um, 
In the next few minutes, I will be discussing our approach in the prevention and management of COVID-associated thrombosis and highlight the controversy surrounding the anticoagulation management of this very unique uh, coagulopathy. This slide shows a multiple mechanism that could contribute to the thrombosis risk in COVID. And as Dr. Hollensorf just explained, COVID induces a prothrombotic state triggered by an unchecked host inflammatory reaction to the virus. And it is not fully understood why some individuals develop this overwhelming immune response while others don't. As hematologists, we have managed prothrombotic coagulopathies in other conditions, but this appears to be different from anything else. This crosstalk between inflammation and thrombosis is illustrated by the finding of this uh, very recently published paper from Boston reporting on their laboratory results on admission of 400 COVID patients. They found an association between D-dimer elevation and other inflammatory markers such as fibrinogen, platelet count, CRP, and ESR. Um, and so they were associated with the risk of thrombosis. They also confirmed that high D-dimer on admission predicted a critical illness and death. To suppress the coagulation activation seen in COVID, heparin and low molecular weight heparin have been most commonly used in these patients. The next slide shows observations suggesting that outcome um, may be improved by systemic um, um, anticoagulation in these patients. The first indication that heparin might be beneficial in COVID uh, came out from the early data from uh, Wuhan in China where they, um, they reported that prophylactic heparin versus no heparin was associated with reduced 28-day mortality for patients with elevated D-dimer. And of note, in China, it's not standard of care to uh, give a thromboprophylaxis because of a lower baseline risk of VTE in this population. But what they found is the, um, if you look at the patients who received heparin in blue, there was a lower 28-day mortality um, on the right-hand side at the higher level of D-dimer. Um, and this is a, it's been a consistent finding, especially at the high level in the range of six um, times the upper limit of normal. Again, they also um, uh, confirmed the finding that elevation of D-dimer overall is uh, a marker of severity of the disease and a prognostic factor. So what we know, um, so who should receive anticoagulation and what is the optimal strategy for COVID-19 in patients? So a lot of debate around this topic and we clearly need more answers. So what we know is COVID-19 is a prothrombotic disease. I hope you're convinced by now. Uh, there is data suggesting that heparin improves outcome. And all patients who require hospital admissions for COVID-19 should receive low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis or unfractionated heparin in the absence of contraindication. And there are expert consensus guidelines um, on this, and that's um, it's quite clear to um, everyone should get it unless there is contraindication. What we don't know is um, the following. What is the optimal intensity of anticoagulation in patients with severe COVID, generally defined as being in the ICU without documented thrombosis? Or will intervening earlier with therapeutic intensity anticoagulation improve outcome? And clearly more data need, is needed on um, better um, determination of the bleeding risk in this patient population. So we don't know really the answer of, uh, to these questions. And um, because of that, um, the Optimal anticoagulation intensity has been the subjects of very much controversy among treating physician and institution. 
As more reports of thrombotic events and autopsy findings of microvascular thrombosis were being published, many institutions have elected to escalate their anticoagulation intensity empirically from prophylactic to intermediate dosing or to simply full dose anticoagulation. And physicians from hospital much affected by the surge appear to more likely prescribe full dose anticoagulation, certainly based on their clinical experience. To illustrate this difference in practice, here is a, a sampling of institutional protocols available online. For instance, at Mount Sinai, who cared for 3,000 patients in one month, offers full dose anticoagulation to any patient with elevation of biomarkers or uh, being or who are in the ICU. And then you see um, color-coded charts um, from three other large centers with very complex algorithms stratifying patients according to their biomarkers, D-dimers, renal function, ICU admission, providing guidance to receive low-dose, intermediate, or full-dose anticoagulation. And of course, as the perceived risk of VTE um, grew uh, higher, these algorithms were um, modified over time. Certainly the desire to do something has resulted in a significant debate about the appropriate anticoagulation approach to prevent um, thrombosis at a time when no data are available to inform decisions and guide clinical care. But fortunately, a number of randomized heparin trials are now being initiated that will inform decision. This is a partial list of these um, anticoagulation trials uh, looking at um, therapeutic heparin compared to standard prophylactic um, 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 heparin uh, in COVID patients. And most of these trials um, and all patients admitted to the floor and they want to look at out, short-term outcome of um, uh, not only thrombosis, but also um, progression of the disease, ICU admission, intubation, and uh, mortality. So hopefully we'll have uh, data available by the end of the year to inform us. And some of these trials are very large and have started to uh, enroll. So here at Stanford, we have a um, small COVID heme group uh, helping providing guidance. Um, and uh, this is what we have right now. So for inpatient monitoring, we uh, recommend serial DIC labs and biomarkers as a way to identify uh, patients who uh, might progress and get uh, critically ill and also um, uh, associated with prognosis. We have a low threshold for thrombosis evaluation when feasible. Of course, um, diagnostic procedures are limited during this infection. For floor patients, we have a very strong recommendation of a standard dose VTE prophylaxis. And um, we are adjusting for a BMI uh, since obesity appears to be a um, risk factor for uh, contracting this infection. We recently um, came up with a weaker recommendation for ICU patients um, uh, with uh, uh, recommending intermediate dose over standard dose. But again, this is a weaker recommendation. It was based on the um, high rate of VTE reported despite standard dose anticoagulation as well as a low bleeding risk that was reported. We do not recommend therapeutic anticoagulation or thrombolytics in the absence of standard indication. And the indication for therapeutic anticoagulation remain the standard one, established DVT, PE, or another standard indication. So patients who are already um, on long-term anticoagulation prior to admission should continue and if possible, uh, switch to heparin or low molecular weight heparin. And uh, we also um, have uh, put a, um, an indication for suspected PE uh, when confirmation cannot be obtained um, due to the pandemic. 
uh, either with a, a rapid jump of rising um, the dimer or also some um, hemodynamic changes. The next topic is, should we consider post-discharge prophylaxis in COVID-19 patients? This is a very hot topic for our hospitalists. We've been asked about this over and over. Um, as you know, post-discharge prophylaxis for medical illness has not been widely implemented into the standard practice, but such an approach has regained momentum in this new uh, COVID era. And some institutions are now incorporating post-discharge guidance into their COVID-specific guidelines. So this is a meta-analysis looking at five large randomized trials that have been conducted over the past decade. One um, was with uh, enoxaparin, 40 milligram, all the other ones with um, oral um, anti um, anticoagulant. And over 40,000 patients have been enrolled uh, on these trials, looking at extended prophylaxis for four to six weeks compared to standard of care in a population of patients generally enriched in heart failure, um, pneumonia, or stroke. This strategy reduces symptomatic or fatal uh, VT event but at the expense of an increased risk of major um, bleeding by twofold. So based on this data, extended um, prophylaxis after hospital discharge has not been widely incorporated into clinical practice. So this approach, um, if it used, uh, should be very selectively for patients at highest risk of patients uh, of, of VTE, as well as um, always after careful assessment of their bleeding risk. So the risk factors are listed here, which are often shared um, by patients uh, you know, infected with COVID. And the options that we have that are approved for this indication are with Varaxaban, um, Betrixaban, or Enoxaparin. So in summary, um, all admitted COVID patients should receive standard VTE prophylaxis, and the potential benefit and safety of intensified empiric prophylaxis, uh, mainly for ICU patients, remains a matter of debate. And whether therapeutic anticoagulation initiated early on can improve outcome in this infection is unknown, but we will find out soon, I hope, with the ongoing trials. Um, therapeutic dose is recommended for established or strongly suspected VTE and considered post-discharge prophylaxis on a case-by-case -case basis if um, the bleeding risk is low. So more evidence-based guidance is certainly needed. And um, our um, recently, the American Society of Hematology convened a panel of experts to come up with evidence-based recommendation to address blood clotting among COVID patients within a very short time frame. So more to come. The last part of my talk is, could targeting inflammation and endothelial injury decrease the risk of thrombosis and mortality in COVID-19? Going back to our previous slide, inhibition of the coagulation with heparin targets only one aspect of these multiple interacting processes that are going on in COVID. Much of the morbidity of this disease is related to unchecked inflammation or endothelial injury in the lung or other various organs, such as the kidney, um, the heart, and the gut. So inhibition of these other mechanisms is likely important to prevent morbidity. So this really underscores the importance of bringing in the expertise of our subspecialty colleagues to better understand and study new therapeutics for this viral infection. And this is a partial list of immunomodulators under investigation in COVID-19. Um, Stanford is participating in some of these trials. And you can see that drugs currently approved for totally different conditions have been repurposed for COVID-19. For instance, um, 
two drugs approved for the treatment of unrelated hematology disorder end up on this list as potential candidates for the prevention of or treatment of the cytokine storm. A Britinid, a BTK inhibitor approved for B-cell disorders such as CLL is one of them. And my colleague, Steve Kutry, has conducted many of the BTA inhibitor trials as an expert in this field. Boxalitinib, a JAK inhibitor, is also a common, uh, has been um, uh, used to treat uh, myelofibrosis um, and uh, GVH disease and has been um, um, developed at Stanford. We were part of the investigations. So, so certainly many opportunities for clinical research. We have already made very rapid progress in our understanding of the disease, but we still have a lot to learn. So specifically, I'd like to thank our ICU um, and hospitalist colleagues who are taking care of these patients. The ICU task force uh, led by um, Angela Rogers, the leadership of Neera Hahuja, and the Stanford uh, Thrombosis Data Team, uh, led by Manisha Desai and William Collins. And this is our Stanford COVID HIM team. Uh, there's Jeffrey Bien, who is a, a hematology fellow, Mei Chen, a clinical assistant professor, uh, doing both pediatric and adult medicine, and of course, uh, my dear colleague and friend, Mary Hollensorf. Thank you. Great, Caroline, as expected, that was, uh, that was also wonderful. Thanks for that really informative lecture. Um, that's in perfect timing as well. We have about 10 minutes, but we can certainly go a little over if needed. Um, and I'll just get into questions. Uh, so the first question, it, probably one of the most popular questions we've been getting since March uh, regarding uh, ABO compatibility. Can you comment more on um, uh, really the potential impact of ABO and, and COVID outcomes? Anything else to mention outside of what you've already mentioned? Sure, I can, I can take this question. Um, so yeah, I think there's been a lot of interest in the impact of ABO blood type, both on the risk of uh, developing COVID-19 infection, as well as on um, as what impact the ABO blood type has on COVID-19 disease outcomes. And just for a quick reminder of the biology, so uh, what are ABO antigens? These are carbohydrate structures that are attached to glycoproteins and glycolipids that are present on the surfaces of red blood cells um, and also other cells, including uh, endothelial cells. And they really only differ in terms of the uh, uh, presence or absence of a terminal monosaccharide indicated by these uh, circle or, or square shapes here. Um, in, in type O, you lack this terminal monosaccharide. And in A and B, you have different monosaccharides. Um, and so how might this biology um, be related to COVID-19? There have really been three uh, major pieces of evidence uh, in this area. So um, one of these studies was uh, done in China, looking at about 2,000 patients where they had ABO blood types done by standard uh, blood, by, blood bank techniques, so ABO identification by serology. And they uh, compared uh, this cohort of about 2,000 patients with COVID against a control uh, population of patients who did not have COVID. And they found, interestingly, an odds ratio for um, having COVID uh, that was 1.21 for individuals with A blood type compared with non-A. And then conversely, for O blood type versus non-O, uh, the odds ratio is 0.67. So suggesting that if you're blood type A, you're at a somewhat increased risk of developing COVID-19 compared with O, you might be at somewhat decreased risk. And really interestingly, uh, this data has now been um, established in, in a completely independent analysis that was conducted by authors in Italy and Spain and was published in the New England Journal. So they did an unbiased, a genome-wide association study looking at 1,600 uh, patients with COVID-19 and respiratory failure. And this GWAS study picked up two loci. One of these was on chromosome nine and um, is at the location of the ABO locus, which encodes uh, the enzyme that attaches this uh, terminal sugar. Uh, they then performed uh, an ABO single nucleotide polymorphism analysis. So there's a set of SNPs that can um, uh, predict very well uh, your ABO uh, phenotype. 
And by doing this ABO SNP analysis in their affected versus their control cohort, they arrived at strikingly similar odds ratios uh, compared with the study done in China, with again, seemingly a slightly higher risk of COVID in blood type A um, and a slightly lower risk in blood type O. And then finally, in, in data that has not been published but is uh, on the 23andMe website, they've looked at 400,000 uh, patients who have COVID-19, and uh, presumably they're using uh, ABO SNP analysis, although it's not very well um, reported on their website. And they similarly came up with the result that it seems that blood type O individuals may be a little bit lower risk of acquiring the infection. Um, there's also some uh, somewhat potentially weaker data, but that shows some similar trends in terms of thinking about COVID-19 uh, prognosis. So for those individuals who have COVID-19, um, how uh, severe will the illness become and will they die of the disease? And it seems that there's a similar trend that type O individuals might do a bit better, type A individuals might do a bit worse. And there are a lot of really interesting biological hypotheses that we can entertain for why this might be. But one really interesting idea is that perhaps these carbohydrate structures that are present on um, endothelial cells uh, could have different susceptibilities to uh, viral entry of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. But that definitely remains to be explored and is just sort of a hypothesis generated by this really interesting clinical data. I think in terms of, you know, counseling our patients or our clinical care, this doesn't really have any major impact right now, but I certainly think it's an interesting thing in terms of thinking about what the underlying biology might be. That's really interesting. And thanks so much for that thorough um, explanation, Maureen. And please do keep us updated uh, in the future as more information comes out on that specific topic. Moving on to the next one, uh, is it pos possible to learn if individuals who have been taking clot inhibiting drugs or alto, for example, uh, before admission, uh, might we be reduced thrombotic issues? So, is there a potential any effect of someone who gets admitted but has been on um, uh, like a Xarelto before they get admitted? I can take that one. Um, let me share my screen. So, um, this is data from. Um, uh, Mount Sinai, looking at patients who were actually taking anticoagulation prior to their diagnosis and looking at mortality. And they had initially 3,000 patients and they look at a match um, a cohort analysis. So these numbers are small, but basically they saw no change in mortality of, um, from being on anticoagulation prior to their diagnosis. Okay, great, great, thank you. Um, next question here, uh, could differences in clot prophylaxis practices explain some of the differences seen in, in these studies, kind of similar? Yeah, uh, yeah I can go ahead. Uh, I, we, we don't know. Uh, I think the standard prophylaxis is um, pretty uniform. I, I think um, adjusting for the weight might be an issue. Um, maybe it wasn't completely um, um, adjusted for some of these patients uh, because it seems to be important here. But in general, I don't think it's a major factor. Okay. Uh, would you consider therapeutic anticoagulation for a patient with a known genetic hypercoagulability? I can take this one too. Um, I mean, if the patient is already on long-term anticoagulation, the answer is easy. Uh, if the patient isn't, I would just um, provide standard DVT prophylaxis. Okay. Okay, great. Um, it, it, birth control has increased the risk of VTE. Have you seen an increase in women on birth control? Um, also, red progesterone might be effective. I don't know if I we haven't have seen any data on this. Yeah. There may not be enough cases to, to answer that question adequately. Okay, great. Um, is a difference in VT perhaps uh, due to a difference in the genotype of the strain on the EU versus the coast? We get a lot of questions about different types of strains and potential impacts. I don't know if we have a clear answer of that. Any, any comments on, that might be a tough question as well. From a viral sequence you're asking or? Yeah, I think, you know, is there, I guess, I, I, and I may be looking at this question wrong, but any difference in the gene, this, this, the serotype of the virus itself that you have noticed any difference in impact, in, at least in regards to 
uh, quadrability? My guess I is no. There, I don't think there is any data. For sure, in China, they have a lower baseline risk of ET overall. And this um, increased risk of VT was, uh, in COVID, was um, mostly reported when the infection moved to um, travel to Europe and the, our East Coast. Then this is where, when the most um, event got reported. Okay. Okay, great. Um, moving on to the next question, um, anonymous question here. D-dimers, higher in blacks might account for a higher morbidity. That's what this question, the person who's writing this question said, they've read that it's higher in blacks. Um, I guess it's really getting to, do you know if there's baseline variability in D-dimer, such as an obesity, diabetes, or others that might also be ultimately contributing to the poor outcomes in certain subsets? Probably another tough question. I mean, I think one thing that we, we do know is that a D-dimer is a relatively nonspecific marker. And I think that's something that you know, has been part of our discussions here is that, you know, we know in general that, you know, for someone, if we're suspecting a VTE, if we have a negative D-dimer, that's helpful. If we have a positive D-dimer, it's not really that helpful because there are so many different conditions that lead to elevation of the D-dimer. Um, I don't know specifically about uh, racial differences or ethnic differences driving uh, differences in D-dimer, but that certainly seems interesting to explore. There hasn't been a lot of data that I've seen in terms of VTE risk break in, broken down uh, according to a uh, racial or, or ethnic group, but that could certainly be a really interesting question to explore. But I do think that this idea that um, the D-dimer here, um, you know, we don't really know exactly what it indicates. Is it just indicating sort of the general inflammatory state or is it a more specific marker of VTE risk? I think that's one of the, the key questions here and we don't know enough about the pathophysiology. Okay. Okay, great. This next question is an interesting one. I'm going to kind of paraphrase it because it's a little bit longer. I'll, I'll click on it so everybody can see. Um, but I think that the crux of the question is just getting into, um, as you guys uh, beautifully described, that you know this is a, um, a hypercoagulable state that a lot of people get into, particularly when they're very ill in the ICU. Um, the question really is asking, should we be more aggressive, I think, if I'm capturing it right, in the level of we anticoagulate? Obviously, we're waiting for data to guide us. Um, is there any sense that we're heading that direction and, and maybe we shouldn't wait any more? I mean, I think it's a tough question to answer without the data, but I guess a bit more of your expertise, do you feel like that we're heading that direction and there's kind of a push to be even more aggressive with anticoagulation? I could take this question. I, I think that this is a really great question, and I think this is kind of the crux of what we've been debating internally and the debates that have been going on sort of nationwide, and not just for this issue, but in other issues related to COVID is sort of what is your uh, level of evidence threshold to, to change your clinical practice. And I think that, you know, we've discussed this a, a lot uh, in our internal heme group. And um, I think our feeling is that um, we, you know, we, we don't have the evidence at this point that supports a therapeutic anticoagulation. We know that there are bleeding risks with therapeutic anticoagulation. Uh, now, you know, we have this new data from Boston, which does show, you know, some bleeding risk in COVID-19 patients. And we know that patients who are in the hospital and in the ICU can be at higher bleeding risk than other patients. And so I think we're concerned about the harms of escalating to therapeutic anticoagulation, particularly given that, you know, we know there is some risk of harm. And at this point, we still don't have the data to support that, that this would be efficacious. And I think that's where we really need these clinical trials that Dr. Berube highlighted to, to really tell us if that's ultimately, uh, you know, the benefits outweigh the harms. Gotcha. That's really helpful. Um, I'll just go to maybe one or two more questions. We're a little bit over, if that's okay with you both. And then, uh, you know, the, the more questions we answer, the more that will pop up because it's a very, you guys are doing a great job and it's a really important topic. What I'll ask if it's okay is we'll send a list of the questions to you. And if any of it can be answered, we'll add that into our follow-up email um, with a Q&A that goes on our website every week. Um, uh, Pedro asked, uh, he was clarifying and Jeffrey answered part of this question, Jeffrey being answered, um, the risk of DVT is lower in Chinese populations, uh, which Jeff, Jeff confirmed, yes. And just kind of a clarification of that, the mechanism. So the baseline risk of DVTs are lower in those populations. Is that kind of the, the belief to be why it's lower now? Yes, I think we attribute it to genetic factors. Okay, well, the epigenetic factors. Okay, gotcha. Um, I, I, Dr. Kaliff asked, uh, if you didn't discuss, he says, can you comment on colchicine used to treat coagulopathy? <laughs> I, I don't think yeah. there is any data. It's coming out, though, very soon, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. 
Um, Marsha asks, uh, does, uh, uh, does COVID PEVT cause very high blood pressure? If so, would blood pressure drop as clots are cleared with Eliquis? Does it, is there any effect on blood pressure in regards to clots? Um, that you're aware of? I, I don't know, certainly the inflammation and the acute illness, um, but um, I think they also have hemodynamic uh, compromise, you know, with the diffused thrombi, you know, at later in the late stage of the disease. Okay, okay, understandable. Um, you know, I'll perhaps end on this question. I think it's um, another really important question that's been coming up and you touched on it. Um, just talking about outpatient setting, and uh, Jimmy Dang asks, are there any hematologic considerations in the outpatient setting that may be prognostics for the disease? Is this too early in the disease process? I think the question we all wonder too, I'm an inpatient doc, but I also wonder at outpatients, should we be more aggressive with them as well? And again, let the data, and I'm sure you guys are talking about this on a daily basis. Well, what most of the literature focus on inpatients. Um, there is very little data on outpatient, but there is certainly not a very high rate of VTE in outpatients. Um, we get uh, questions about uh, whether they should consider um, outpatient prophyl DVT prophylaxis. Again, um, the risk remains low, but if you have a patients who are at especially very high risk, um, and they are immobile at home, quarantine, um, it, you know, that, that something could be considered, but always after consideration of the bleeding risk. Understood, understand. Um, guys, thank you so much, Dr. Bourbe, Dr. Hallhorst. That was a really wonderful presentation. We certainly will um, invite you back for updates um, as you feel appropriate. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you for our panelists. We apologize again for the logistical issues. There should not be a password in the future. We will uh, fix that with IRT and uh, make sure we communicate in advance so there's no uh, glitches like we had today. Hope everybody has a great day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.